when I also taught high school, grade nine and grade 12, English language arts. So we're going through Romeo and Juliet, we're going through stories. I, I told the chair of the department, I said, you know, sometimes English class feels like therapy. And he said, that's why it's called the humanities markets. We're teaching them how to be human. And I was looking at the mental health issue that was going on in schools and around the world. And I wanted to get to the core of it. And the work that I do, I feel is addressing that problem, which is acting from your identity, acting from your specifically virtues and values. Um, I'm a, I'm a student of philosophy. I do practice stoicism and it's, it's really an intersection of all the things that I am. Like <laughs> to be a communication coach for parents of preteens, really, I feel is to say a divine calling. When was the last time you experienced a conflict at work? One that impacted your leadership or that you struggled to handle as a leader? Perhaps you're dissatisfied or it's a regret for you that you didn't handle it in the way you wanted to. What about open communication? Is that something that you find challenging? What's the best way to foster autonomy, empowerment, independence even among the people that you lead. My guest today is Marcus Aurelius Higgs. He is a communication coach who works with parents, particularly those of pre-teen age, so 10 to 14 years old, helps them to show up better, maintain a meaningful relationship with their children. And that may sound like a bit of a left field one for a leadership podcast, but if you think back to the questions I asked you a moment ago, so many of those same challenges that leaders face, particularly new leaders, are also challenges of parents for kids of this age. And unsurprisingly, they're challenges that a communication coach like Marcus deals with day in, day out. He's also been a teacher. He's an author. So we'll be hearing a little bit about his book as well. And today's conversation is going to cover all of those leadership and communication and parenting challenges that I mentioned. I'm particularly looking forward to it, not being a parent myself. There's some great insights of the of that world that I'm looking forward to. We're also going to cover some of the crossovers between our two areas of expertise because there are a surprising number of them. So there's some great lessons to be learned from that conversation. So something a bit different today. I hope you enjoy it, listener. Do feel free to drop me a review or an email or a message on LinkedIn and let me know your thoughts. Welcome to the Leading with Integrity podcast. Leadership talk for the modern manager. With your host, David Hatch. Marcus, welcome to Leading with Integrity. It's lovely to meet you. Great to have you on the show. Really looking forward to our conversation. David, thank you for sharing your platform. And yeah, looking forward to this conversation. I love when two different areas collide and we find the intersection. So yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's it's a bit of a left field one, isn't it? But I think there's going to be so many areas actually of crossover that might surprise us. So we'll, we'll see see how we get on. And to kick us off, over to you, really, to introduce yourself to the listeners, tell them a bit about your background, career history, what you get up to today, what gets you out of bed in the morning, really. My name is Marcus Aurelius Higgs. Uh, that is my real name. <laughs> my dad gave me Marcus Aurelius. So I studied communication and journalism in university. My mother's from the Philippines and my dad's from the Bahamas, and that's worth noting. I'm a third culture kid, they call it. So it's where your passport doesn't necessarily match the country you grew up in. I grew up in the States and um, that influences the work that I do today. So right after university, I went to South Korea and I was there as an English uh, missionary teacher. So I went there with the church and then I say my, my worldview expanded. No animosity towards the church, but I didn't want to proselytize something I didn't believe. And, but I still believed in people. I still loved teaching. I loved teaching so much that I continued teaching English, conversational English. I taught in Saudi Arabia, Spain, and then Thailand. I taught all levels, taught young learners, um, kids, kids zero to eight, zero to 10, and then middle school, high school then college students, young adults, and so on. The work that I do now is I'm a parent, I'm a communication coach for parents of preteens. 
And we can get into the specifics of that, but I help parents during this first identity breaking of their child's life to understand their audience, understand their kid of what's going on, and then how they can meet that to specifically bring forth their potential, bring out the best in them. Uh, this has a lot of intersections with leadership. A, a lot of the things when you look at organizations, again, the family is an organization. There's just a collective of people with their different identities working towards the same goal. So that's what I do now. That's what gets me out of bed and jumping on podcasts with awesome people. <laughs> So I think the first question that, that jumps out of that is what originally drew you to working with parents specifically, that age category of children as well, and, and then communication coaching more generally. Was it just a, a natural offshoot from teaching or was there something else behind it? And there are many, many different intersections. So I keep on saying the word intersections. There are many different origin stories. First of all, I love communication. This is my book, um, Inspire Life Through Words of Wellbeing. I don't see it so much, but I love words. Words create our world. And I remember while studying communication in university, our teacher said the quality of your life is directly related to the quality of your communication. Your ability to talk to yourself and understand yourself and your ability to talk and connect with others. It's one of the four um, skills of the 21st century. Communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and creativity, right? If you have those, regardless of AI, regardless of whatever context you're in, you'll be all right. So I love communication. As an English language teacher, as learning languages, learning how to extract meaning from <laughs> just different conversations. Like, I, I love understanding why people do what they do. Why for parents? So I taught high school and middle school. This is another book I keep. My students is called, can't see it so well. It's called the goodbye book. But when I was leaving my school, um, ah, you can't see it. It's, it's perfectly fine. It's filled with stick figures with afros and it's notes from the little kids, from the fifth graders about, um, the time we had together. And when I also taught high school, grade nine and grade 12, English language arts. So we're going through Romeo and Juliet. We're going through stories. I told the chair of the department, I said, you know, sometimes English class feels like therapy. And he said, that's why it's called the humanities markets. So we're teaching them how to be human. And I was looking at the mental health issue that was going on in schools and around the world. And I wanted to get to the core of it. And the work that I do, I feel is addressing that problem, which is acting from your identity, acting from your specifically virtues and values. Um, I'm a, I'm a student of philosophy. I do practice stoicism and it's, it's really an intersection of all the things that I am like <laughs> to be a communication coach for parents of preteens really, I feel is to say a divine calling. One thing that I did not mention, um, I'm speaking to the person. I, I think this is me speaking to my father when I came to the Bahamas when I was 12, the tumultuous time we had with our communication, understandably at that age, that this is what happens. And he just didn't have the skills or the support. He was the adult in the room, so he set the tone. But um, I think this is a reply to be like, hey, like I knew my dad loved me. There was no physical abuse in that regard, but it's just like, hey, communication could have been better. And um, I think I'm answering that that issue as well. So this is my burden to bear that I bear happily. Okay, there's a lot in there to, to unpack. It kind of reminds me as well. It's, it's, I'm bound to say this being British, but it's a very British mentality as well. The kind of it, you keep a lot of it inside. There's a lot of internal kind of monologue. There's not so much communicating outwards. You know the the stereotypical stiff upper lip, all of that stuff. Most of which I think for the modern British person is nonsense. But it's kind of this cultural expectation sometimes, isn't there? Um, and I yeah. think it's really interesting as well that you mentioned critical thinking there. I'm often complaining about the social media impact on people's ability to apply critical thought. And I think that is a particularly interesting, uh, to use your word, intersection, again, with the work you do with preteens, because that must be an incredibly difficult added extra, if you like. Certainly when we were that age, it wouldn't have been a factor. But these days, I, I mean, I, I shudder to think how that must affect kids of that age and adjusting to adulthood when you've also got to remember that 
everything you've ever done, said, or had it, had a picture of is on the internet now for all time and is inescapable. So yeah. we're going massively off topic there, but what no, do you think about that? On topic. Cool. Uh, well, you know, there's an, there's an added layer. You touched the, the tip of the iceberg, but then there's something deeper than that. This would actually speak to leaders also in businesses because you're right. There's an image out there that has been burnt into the psyche, if you will, be it social media. Kids are dependent on their parents from zero to 10 about, and then they get an understanding of a new perspective of the world, which is why they start to explore. And they're going out to figure out their new ways to view the world. I want to try these. And it's natural. That's the thing about it. When you understand this is the natural order of things. Ideally, you want them speaking with other trustworthy, present adults in their life, coaches, teachers, um, who will have different views from you, but you know they're still working towards the well-being of the community. Ideally, you'd want them around peers who, again, have different views from you, but they're working towards the well-being of the community. The unfortunate thing with social media is that kids are forming their ideas behind the screen. And what that means is they're forming their identities and likes and shares and YouTube characters who are, are hijacking their attention. And we are the stories we tell ourselves. So now they're, they're working through these narratives in their head. And then when the screen closes, the question is, who are you? And, and if you really don't know who you are then, when you're challenged by life, because really life is just about managing stresses, three stresses in particular, but managing stresses, that's what life is about. The stress to maintain, the stress that knocks you out of the blue, and the stress to expand. It means you're pushing, you're, you're exerting a force on that. But if you can't ex if you can't exert a force from a strong identity, you're easily toppled over. And, and that's the problem or that's the challenge that kids have in this day and age. Um, <laughs> we were speaking of peep show before the start of this. And the work that we do as parents, caregivers, and teachers is we walk with a kid in their mind to make sense of what's going on in there, which is why like what, well, while, while the character is going on with all that stuff in their mind, it's just them one in that room, that empty room by themselves where you need to bring a person you trust who comes in with no judgment. Oftentimes that's a counselor. It could be a therapist, it could be a trusted friend. Ideally that's a parent or again, a person who knows your story, who can help you make sense of it. They're not trying to put it on there, but they're like, Hey, tell me, tell me what you're thinking about. Now let's, uh, let's make a cohesive narrative. So yeah, kids, kids actually have it worse. We noticed an uptick in 2012. And that was after social media set in about the twenties of where they were raised on social media, again, stealing their attention and then not really forming an identity that is serving the community. That's where I think the problem is. Your, your thoughts or now, what do you, what is your take on that? So I think for me, because I've always had an interest in politics as well, I've had mm -hmm. an interest. It's, it's a love hate relationship, if I'm honest. So the political aspects and connotations of, of social media, I think, uh, are where I've really got, gone down the rabbit hole a little bit in the research and looking into it and especially the Facebook thing, you know, Cambridge Analytica, that whole thing. But what I think I really learned about it and social media as a whole from that is the way. And again, it might seem like common sense to people who've grown up with it. I don't know, but it, it's the way the algorithm functions. And it, if you think about it in terms of it, what it was built to do, which was sell, sell our data to advertisers, right? So it's the more of a thing you look at, the more of that thing it will show you because it's trying to get you to buy something and look at more ads and they get more money and so on and so on. That's a problem though, when it comes to political adverts, for example, and obviously Facebook was over the coals in front of all sorts of different investigation committees over certain elections. I think, you know, there was the, um, the one where I can't remember what year it was now, but it's, it was 2016, wasn't it? I think the one where Trump got it. US election. A, yeah. yeah. There was a big, big investigation there. We had something similar, but perhaps less robust with the whole Brexit thing here as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
And I think if that's the way that it functions, going back to what we're saying just now about critical thinking and how that's a skill that I think, well, personally, I think that the kind of the pre-teen teenage years, that's when you need to be learning that skill because you need it for the rest of your life. And if you can't do it, then you end up falling foul to things like this much easier. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's kind of my bugbear about it. And then on top of it, I mean, we, we'll get way into the politics of it, but it's, it's what's funded in our, in our schools and education and the way that critical thinking is or isn't taught and that sort of, that angle of it as well. So that's, that's where I'm coming from with the whole social media. <laughs> yeah. You know, the word critique or mm. critical means to hit. Mm -hmm. And we define our ideas and we, we really know who we are when we are hit. Like when I say life is about managing stress, it's, it's when you're tested that you really know who you are. And we're tested when we come up against ideas that don't align with ours. So critical thinking means holding space with another person or an idea that probably hits your identity. And that's why I'm saying if you don't have a strong identity, you, you'll be blown about or you'll be, it, it, and it's okay to have differing opinions indeed that's that's how you grow but um yeah if you don't have that skill of critical thinking and it needs to be met with a strong sense of identity if not you you won't grow you'll be knocked over you will be utterly destroyed yeah indeed i mean we could go around in circles talking about this particular bit for ages i think but i think it probably leads us nicely into the next question though um so those the teenage years the pre-teen the lead up to it it's fair to say, I think, for most people in their lives, that's going to be probably one of the most, if if not the most, difficult periods of change that most of us will go through in our lives. It is that, it's that transition, isn't it, from childhood and innocence into adulthood. So what have you learned about change specifically from the work that you do? One, change is inevitable. We're continually changing. The difference about the preteen and teen years is that it's our first change, our first time at the rodeo. It's our first change into big expectations. Um, what's interesting about this stage also is the, the collective narrative, society, what it expects of kids. Because there's this study by Ellen Galansky. She wrote this wonderful book, The Breakthrough Years. And in it, adults, when they describe teenagers, they describe them as the 50, 56% of them describe them as immature. Now I want you to think about this. Is a toddler an immature child? No. Or is a child an immature, um, teenager? Like, no, you, you don't describe them as such because they're at that developmental stage. So there's certain expectations for that stage. And, and the point I'm making is that in the preteen and teenage years, it is actually characterized by taking high risk. Like their, their emotional highs are very high and their emotional lows are very low because biologically, um, there's more dopamine dropped in whenever they experience something new and it's novel. Zero to 10, their brain was growing as a child and it was absorbing everything as a sponge. But then here at this age, when they're asked to be individuals, they're actually pruning, they're cutting off parts. And it's like, I'm going to specialize in this, but they don't know what they're going to specialize in. And so then that's why they're trying to make sense of this. So understandably, they're discombobulated or dysregulated. When you understand that, you can be more gracious towards it. And if you're more gracious towards it, we say in education and in parenting, it means to bring forth but you create the environment for what's inside there to emerge. Oftentimes it's when we start to be controlling and we spoke about this a bit earlier, but when you start to be controlling and dictating and um, uh, uh, when you start to dictate, that's where you get dictator from. Yeah. So it's how do you let it emerge and also collaboratively let it emerge, actually give them some trust to say, look, I trust you with this so that you can, I can scaffold your growth and your development. So it, it can be a tough stage. It, it is. I mean, it's difficult, but life is tough. Um, 
<laughs> if, if you teach them these skills now, when the stakes are lower, stakes just means what do I have to gain and what do I have to lose? Like if you teach them now, while the stakes are lower, when the stakes are much higher, when they're owning a business, when they're a, a business leader operating, leading other people, they know they have the integrity to do it. Possibly another tangent. Um, and mm -hmm. I'm sure it's an unfair comparison to a lot of people in their early careers, but it does remind me of sort of that when you first enter the workplace, um, particularly what you're saying about you're not sure what you're going to specialize in yet. So you try lots of different things, or at least some of us do. <laughs> Um, and can you find the thing that you, that you really love or you're really good at? Ideally both, although that's not always a given in most people's careers, unfortunately. And there is that, it is a kind of immaturity, isn't it? Because you're still trying to figure out how your career is going to go. And what that reminded me of going, tying it back to the teenage years again is all of that pressure they put on you at school, particularly as you're coming towards the end of your secondary education. What are you going to do the rest of your life? What's your career path? Which university are you going to go to? What are you going to study for the next five years? All of those kind of really high pressure questions. And I don't know. I mean, I'd love to hear from your experience, what your point of view is on that about, is it the best way to do it or what's the other option? Yeah. So my whole thing is, this is life. <laughs> You're going to hear me say that a lot. <laughs> and when I say this is life, it means know thyself and you'll understand the secrets of gods and men. The whole thing about life is life is continually asking you, who are you? Remember Lawrence of Arabia when he yells across the desert? Who are you? <laughs> um, when you're a child, you grow up. And this is the hero's journey, actually. And the hero's journey is just a cycle again and again and again and again of refining you to understand who you are. So Rupert Steiner also writes about this if you get, get deep into his works. But you're a child. You grow up. Um, you meet a mentor and a mentor or says, I've gone this way before. Take this. It'll help you on your way. They give you some tools, some ideas and some thoughts. Life asks you, who are you? And you say, I'm not a child. And you find some peers, right? You answer by saying who I'm not. You're with your peers and you're, you're with them in their company, in your business, if you will. And then something happens and life asks you, who are you? And you say, I'm not my peers. I'm not like them. They're not like me. And life says again, I'm not asking you who you're not. I'm asking you, who are you? And then you go through a dark night of the soul. Um, then there's a resurrection and there's an understanding of, oh, this is who I am. And life asks you, who are you? And you say, I am blah, 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 blah. When um, I, I, you shared your story with, with the community, right? If they've listened to the podcast. So, when the the business you were a part of, and please correct me if I'm wrong, not to speak into your life, yeah. the company that you were a part of, when you stopped working with them, I don't, I don't know, yeah, you had to ask yourself, who am I? So you found yourself again right at the beginning of another cycle, and life is asking, yeah, who are you? And you had to reinvent yourself. You, I'm, I'm a presenter now. I'm a speaker. I'm a podcast. I'm a bringer together or I'm a leader, or, you know, you're like, yeah, leadership is something I'm interested in. So again, life is continually asking you, who are you? And it's going to put you again and again. Yeah. I mean, with the benefit of hindsight, I think for me, the who are, who are you question was very shortly before I left that company and it was answering that question that led me to leave. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, um, but I like, see what um, you're saying. Yeah. Well, Steve, Steve Jobs says the dots connect themselves. And when you look back, and, that, and that's just how it is, right? Uh, your story is made in the moment, yet you realize it in retrospect. Sometimes with those rose-tinted glasses, but hey. <laughs> <laughs> if you do it right. If yeah, well, it yeah, right. absolutely, absolutely. Um, so something else that you've touched on a bit earlier there was about this stage that the preteens go through where they start to challenge that authority, which obviously for parents, they're going to be the main, I would assume, um, authority figure in their life at that point. So I know it's one of the things you speak about and how parents can establish and I'm not sure about the word enforce, but you, it's the only one I can think of that conveys my meaning. Um, how do they establish those rules and then and help, help the child stick to the rules, but without turning it into this kind of adversarial dictator sort of relationship? Yeah, it, it's a balance. It's not easy. Um, so. Every good story has an antagonist. 
<laughs> if you're a protagonist by definition, I love words. <laughs> so protagonist just means the one who's walking forward, the one who's progressing in the story. Antagonist just means the one who's against them. Doesn't mean villain or anything. If a person is trying to express themselves, trying to know themselves and they're on a journey, the person who's probably going to be the antagonist is most likely the most immediate person who's been in their life, who they find most conflict with, which yes, oftentimes is the parent. Um, another antagonist worth, worth exploring is the antagonist inside their head, which again is peep show. <laughs> He's in conflict with himself continually. <laughs> Uh, because conflict is what drives a story we have in communication it says in all relationships there's conflict but conflict does not define the relationship what defines the relationship is how you manage it now for parents to manage conflict at this stage this is the advice you didn't ask for <laughs> but um I, yeah I, I don't give advice unless i know your context but, but this is what, what I've noticed. It's not even I've noticed. This is what science says. Keep your stuff together. Keep in your integrity when everything else is being dysregulated. Again, you're setting the tone. And if you're listening to this and you're um, the leader of a company, this, 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 this pertains to you too. But you keep your head about you when everybody else is losing theirs. Uh, misquote Rudyard Kipling. Yeah. When all about you is going to crap. You then also invite those who are subordinate to you or those who are working with you. Recognize their autonomy. Recognize their full human sovereignty. Like as you want the best to come out of them. So you invite them into the problem solving process, co-collaboration, you call it. Um, you acknowledge their voice so they know they have some say in it. And then you agree on something or you agree on something that both of you can agree upon. It's not going to be easy. There are going to be growing pains. And yeah, I could tell you inside this quick snippet, but, um, it takes effort and, and, and the families that actually grow and flourish like that, it's when all voices and all perspectives are recognized. There is a leader who will make the decision. And the reason I can trust his decision or her decision is because they've proven themselves. They have a track record of trust. Trust is built on three things. I know you're working for my well-being. Your ideas make sense. And I know you speak the truth. Yeah. Um, the last thing I'll say to your original question of how to, how, how to have a more harmonious household. Households are really never harmonious. It's, it's just you figuring out how to play with all the, the noise going on, making a symphony of the cacophony. That's what it is. It's establishing rules and regulations. There are boundaries to things, and we agree upon these boundaries together um, because growth has to happen in these confines. That said, I want you to grow. I want you to flourish. I want you to express yourself as a parent or as a teacher. That's, this is what I'm communicating because your growth actually contributes to the family, to the community. But while you're doing that, all of your emotions are valid. All behaviors, those that are destructive, that don't add to the well-being of the group or don't add to the well-being of yourself, we have to have a conversation about those or we have to, we have to address those. So, and, and, and then again, that's what it is for an organization too. Yes. I think so much of that applies to teams as well, particularly the, the cacophony. Um, <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yeah, but I certainly, I mean, the three, the three factors of building trust. I mean, that's, that's spot on, isn't it? I mean, that's got to be everything that a leader is trying to achieve if they're, if they're doing it the right way and with the right intent, at least. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's huge parallels there, I think, which is why I asked the question in case any of the listeners are wondering. <laughs> Another kind of similar vein or similar question, really. And again, there is a parallel, I think, between parents and leaders or teams here what can parents do particularly to 
model those sort of the healthy conflict resolution and better communication within their family or team, whichever one we're talking about. You know, when we started this podcast, I was wondering, you know, what are the similarities and what are the differences between a family and a business corporation? You can't fire your family. <laughs> that's, that's what I was thinking. Absolutely. That's it. For conflict resolution, there's a wonderful book called Crucial Conflicts or Crucial Conversations. And life is about having difficult conversations. Remember, first of all, know your audience, know what their desires are. Everybody, everybody, every character is moving towards a desired outcome. So understanding what a person wants in the situation, that's the first thing. Second thing is understanding what's stopping them from getting it. And while I might have a perspective of what's stopping us, you have a different perspective. Having that open conversation where everybody feels as though their voices are heard. And then again, coming to a, a, an agreed upon solution. I know it sounds so easy when I say it. And then I know their politics. Like, like if, if we could say this in politics, Hey, everybody bring your, <laughs> bring your concerns. <laughs> we'll look at all of them and then we'll have one person make a decision. We'd live in a utopia. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's theory versus practice, isn't it? Because in theory, that's how politics works now, isn't it? But everyone knows it's yeah. not in practice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so then, you know, coming back to Cambridge Analytics, we had outside stories influencing the stories or the ideas, the beliefs that are happening inside people's heads, which swayed their action. That's one point I'll make. Second point is when the groups are smaller, it's easier to make, you're more agile. It's lean um, decision-making. A third thing I'll say is when there is a culture, and Seth Godin describes culture as people like us do things like this. Culture is just collective identity. Um, <laughs> he, you said, or I, this is me putting words in your mouth, but we talked about how we don't like corporations say we're a family when you're not a family, you're a group of people working towards an outcome. Now there's business culture and there's a family culture, which they may overlap, but call it what it is. You can't fire your family. You can fire me <laughs> or I can fire you. Um, the point I'm making is when there's a culture and we know what people like us do, it's easier to make decisions. So establishing that collective identity early on, again, makes rules easier to, to ex execute. Yeah. I, I was going to go into some of the differences a bit more because, um, yeah, you've beaten me to it, but <laughs> I think, yeah, that whole thing about the, you know, the, the business describing itself as the family. And, and yeah, I mean, the listeners have heard me talk about this before with past guests and, I think a most recent one described it as it, it's a bit of an ick factor, which I thought was quite a funny way of putting it. But I mean, I kind of get it. You know, a lot of CEOs, that's probably the way they see their company. They see these people as their family and they're the paternal presence. And it's all about, in their mind, at least, it's all about positive things and how they will love and respect each other and they'll help each other however they can. But I think from... From the grassroots level, from the employee level, when you hear that, all, the, all it really means to you is that they, first of all, as you say, you can't fire your family. So you don't, you don't choose your family either. Whereas you, you, most of us are choosing where it's we work. We're, we're choosing where we expend our effort. Yes, it's a transactional thing at the beginning in most companies, but yeah, it's, it just kind of, it conveys that expectation from the boss in inverted commas that you'll do whatever needs to be done and whatever you're told, regardless of whether it's in your interests, whether it aligns with your job, your contract, your legal rights, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there's more and more extreme examples we could go into. Um, so I think that's, that's a big difference. What are the other differences, do you think, in terms of how these two kind of entities operate as a unit? I can tell you this, like I, I spent time in Southeast Asia, Europe, and so on. Like you can come back to your family. Um, family comes through. You know what? You know what? One, I'm thinking about this. I was working at a petrol company in the Middle East. And 
Arabs culturally really honor their family. Like they, they know the, it's very important to them. They hold that value. It's important to them. And I put in my vacation time before the deadline. And then they had an influx of students and they said, no, we can't let you go. Um, because we have to teach these students. And I was just like, I'm going to go spend Christmas with my mother. I haven't seen in so long and I don't know when I'm going to see her again. And I had to make the decision of either quitting my job or staying on to teach these classes. The reason I bring that up is because no, we're not family. <laughs> you, 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 and again, we went over, we went over trying to make provisions and, you know, compromise to say what, what can be done. I'd already purchased the tickets, but I'll get into the details of it. A business operates for, to be of service towards the bottom line, like you said, where it depends on everybody has different, uh, end desires of, of why they're doing their business. But a family, a family says, I'm here for you, for this relationship, for us to be better people. I think, again, the desired outcome at the end is different. A family says, well, friends are, it's mutually beneficial. Like, I'm your friend because I'm a better person being with you. And I, I think you see me eye to eye. A family is, you know my story from the beginning. You knew me at my worst. You know me at my best. And you still choose to be around because... Yeah, there's some family you don't choose to be around, but um, how else is it different? I, I think also a business forms itself towards a particular end. Like you, you organize to bring this out in the world. Whereas a family is, we organize to create a clan, to create traditions, to create an identity, a collective identity, because social beings need collective identity. So, yeah. Those are some differences in yourself. Yeah, I think another difference that comes to mind, you, you almost got to it, but I'll say it anyway. And again, anyone who's listened to previous episodes, they've probably heard me say this. Family means different things to different people. But for a lot of people in the world, family is a negative thing they don't want anything to do with. And um, their workplace might even be the opposite of that. And so if they suddenly hear work being described as a family, that can that can be a trigger even for, for some people. And so... Again, there's that coming at it from the business owner, the, the leader side of it. It's the, you need to have an awareness that whilst that word may mean something to you, it may also mean something very different to other people who you are leading. And you need to consider that before you start making these sweeping statements. <laughs> words don't hold meaning. People hold meanings for words. Mm. Hear, hearing you say that, one thing came to mind though. In the developing world where resources are scarce. That's why family is more important. And that's why it's everything because when everything is gone, really sometimes all you have is your family. Whereas in the developed world, parts of East Asia, United States, UK, Australia, and so on. Yeah, I, I could see how we go to work to socialize. So that's where we connect with other people. And um, you, you actually can leave your family more easily. That's a good point as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, particularly in some of the economically turbulent times we've had in recent years, I mean, it's potentially easier to move out of home than it is to move your job. <laughs> uh, again, I mean, that, it depends on so many different factors, though, like certain industries. That's not true at all. If, you, if all you need is a laptop and a phone and you can do it wherever, whereas if you worked in, say, a service industry or entertainment or something like that i mean that would have been its own set of challenges during covid of course we've kind of been going back and forth between our two areas of, of specialism here and i think you know several of the topics that you speak about that have come up already today things like conflict resolution you know this need for open communication issues around independence and autonomy even and identity they're also issues that a new leader They'll be struggling with at least one of those, I would, I would hazard a guess. So what kind of additional tips? Because you've already given us some very good advice anyway, but what other kind of top tips, if you like, would you offer for navigating that process and dealing with some of those issues as a leader? You know, I'm going to share a high-level metaphor that just came to mind. When you look at food 
It's just proteins, starch, and fat rearranged in different ways. And then you go to different countries. It's just differentiation of spices and how it's prepared. Really what we're talking about is human development. And human development is the same. To be autonomous, to be all you can be, to understand that, and to flourish. Um, when you look at a business vertical or a family vertical or so on, it's, it's still the same concepts. Now, to your question, what is something I would leave with leaders? We are, we were in the information age with the flow of information. And then we entered into the attention age. Everybody's trying to put their hooks in you to get your attention. One of the most valuable things you will have heading into this new era of AI is trust. I think we're heading into the trust stage. It's always been there, but this is the new economy that's going to, to actually, that's going to be most valuable because it's relationships. Relationships is uh, other people matter. And that's one of the most valuable things in this human existence. And in order to build and develop your relationships, you need to develop your trust. That's the first thing. The second thing is how do you develop that trust? One way, there, there are many other ways. One way worth mentioning is to repair and reconnect when you make a rupture. What do I mean by that? If you do something that's out of alignment or out of agreement with your identity, own it. Say, this is not the type of person I want to be. Say, this is what I promise to do going forward. And then you act on it. That's how I can trust you as a leader. That's how I can trust you as a partner I want to collaborate with. Um, yeah, repair and reconnect. I've been in relationships, business relationships, where it was just like, and, and also having, having open communication so that we all know what we're moving towards. And, um, as those, as those ruptures happened and we repaired and reconnect, it solidifies the relationship. It makes it stronger. And yeah, that's, that's what you need in business. If you want to stay in business, it's all about relationships. Very important lesson. I think again, for, for both of our fields really, but, but just for communication and just getting on in life as well. I mean, in, in the business context, you know, it's, I'm sure we've all worked for companies that have made that mistake and it's so easily done isn't it you know you you go through the whole marketing thing of this is our values this is who we are as a company as an entity blah 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 and then that temptation is there something will come up there'll be like this massive contract that goes against one of those values in some way but it's really it's a good contract there's some good money there and and most most business leaders will be like well you know i've got to say yes i mean and then that'll be that and they'll never if it ever comes up again, it would just be, well, you know, I've got a responsibility to the shareholders. That's why I did it. And there's very few, there are rare exceptions and they usually make the news because they do say, yeah, this wasn't in, in alignment with our values. We apologize. It's not going to happen again in future. If this kind of temptation arises, this is what we'll do instead. And that's very rare, but it makes the headlines because exactly as you say, the result is. They have a stronger relationship with their, with their team afterwards. In order to do that, you have to know who you are. You have to know your identity. One time I remember this is real quick. Um, I was, I was speaking with this, this gym friend. He's, he's a workout partner and a business idea presented itself. And just in a moment, he said, no. Nah. And then when asked why, he said, that's just not me. And I noticed how easy decision was how to sit, how easy decision making was for him. And when you know yourself, you just know, oh yeah, I'm in alignment with that or I'm not. And as a leader, when you speak of integrity, yeah, that, that, that's what comes to mind. One sh quote I'd love to share with you is by um, John O'Donohue. Are you familiar with him? He's an Irish poet. Um, he used to write, yeah. used to write about spiritual stuff and he would, join spirituality and science. Anyways, he said, um, the duty of privilege is absolute integrity. And if you have the privilege of being a leader, that means people are giving you their time and their attention and you have the privilege of controlling them. When I say controlling, like they've offered that to you. It's not like you're iron fisting it. 
And if that's the case, have integrity. Like, and you can't have integrity if you don't know who you are. And you know what? Having integrity just means be true to you. It might be your, your, um, Russell Branson. Like you're having fun. You're going out doing your thing. Like do you, like, I'm not going to tell you not do you. I can't tell you who you are, but be integrated, be together with who you are. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think integrity is one of those words. I mean, I, I've chosen it for obvious reasons, I hope by now, but. I think it, it is a word that you see, it pops up in these lists of company values constantly, doesn't it? And I think a conversation I had with a guy called Drew Dudley a few episodes back really liked his new kind of take on this idea that integrity isn't a value. Integrity is the result of living in alignment with your values, whatever those values may be. And I think that kind of speaks to this problem, doesn't it, of where companies go wrong, where leaders get confused. and too often it is just a marketing exercise cynically a lot of the time there is a, a positive intent behind it but it just kind of falls short in the implementation or it gets muddied by what will sound good versus what we actually intend to do or what's actually achievable and and so on and so on so if, if we look at the word inter means like it's interlock um integrated it's woven together and that's why it's firm you're right we have virtues and values. Virtues means we're working towards the well-being of others. We're working towards the well-being of ourselves. But values means what's important. If you know what your values are, how do you weave that together? And now let's look at the opposite of the word. It would be to um, degrade. Or what's the opposite of integrity, you would say? I would say it, it's something that fall. It's falling apart. Yeah. Inter means in between, interwoven. The opposite would be, you could look it up. But for me, it means something that falls apart, right? And it falls apart because it, it doesn't know itself. I feel like I'm repeating myself. But uh, when, 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 you, when you look up um, the antonym of integrity on the computer, did you, did you look it up? I'm, I'm just Googling as we speak. So antonyms of integrity, the top two according to Google are dishonesty and division. Division. That's okay. a good one, isn't it? I like division. Yeah. yeah. It, again, it's, it's falling apart. Mm -hmm. So now I'm thinking of entropy or syntropy. Is it coming together towards, again, a mission? Is it aligned to this is an idea that we're moving towards? Or is it just willy nilly, just all these random parts all about? It's just like light. Light really can't be useful to burn something unless it's concentrated. Yeah. I think when we tie it up in words like honesty as well, things like that, I, I, I don't know. I, I do like that other definition, but I, and particularly the way you describe and define values, I think it can be both. I think integrity can be a yeah. value. That can be something that's important to people, but it's also the result as well. So yeah, maybe it's a self fulfilling value. I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, words can be both things. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's, <true>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's why there are many definitions inside the book. That's so, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. But, but, but it's worth it's worth talking about because now these concepts are in our head, mm -hmm. and if if it ever does get muddy, we can have a conversation about. Yeah, what what does this company stand for? Is this what we talk about? All for talking about these things. That's well. That's why we're here, isn't it? Really. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So I've got a, another interesting question for you. Hopefully, particularly given your kind of your career history and you've you're very well travelled. You know, you've worked in different places, different countries, and so I'd love to hear what your biggest leadership lesson is from your your career experiences so far. Because I feel like you probably have a slightly different take on it, perhaps, than others. <laughs> Leadership is different from country to country. That's for sure. One thing that is the same though is it's, it's, it's an axiom of communication. Understand your audience. Like know, know your audience because when you're leading, you're doing it with groups of people. And if you're leading groups of people, you want them to follow you, 
They have to trust you and they will trust you if they can communicate with you, if they feel as if they're seen, they're validated, they're heard. Um, that's the thing that comes to mind now. I will say something that's shifting in leadership is because we're more globalized and again, we're living online. So we're getting an image of what other people are doing. A lot of the traditional leadership uh, roles are, are shifting. And what do I mean by that? In, in East Asia, in the Middle East, you find that patriarchal, patriarchal feel of I'm the leader, what I say goes, and you know, that heavy hand of, of a dictator almost like. I think that's shifting. I think as, as the flow of information is, is speeding up and we realize, Hey, I don't have to deal with this. I don't have to be controlled if I don't want to. I, I think that's shifting. It's certainly my great hope that it's shifting. Um, I said, yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. I mean, that whole traditional approach to leadership, it's no exaggeration to say I hate it. <laughs> it just, I, it's just so out of date. Like it's, it's, it's not even from like the seventies. It's from like the industrial revolution, isn't it? Of, it's, know. it's from, I was going to say it's from the Middle East, like biblical of <laughs> when you're well, trying, yeah, anyhow. potentially. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you still see it. I mean, it's not just in the Middle East and places like that. It's, you still see it in other, you know, Western countries like the UK. The, the number of businesses and CEOs and sort of directors and managers who still think like that. And I don't want to talk them down. Like it's it's not their fault. It's just it's this self perpetuating thing, isn't it? Of how was how was your manager when you got your first job? How did they treat you? Okay, well, okay, that's what you've learned in your head. That's management. That's what you're going to do when it's your turn. And very few people. That's not fair. Not enough, yeah. let's say. I don't want to say very few, mm -hmm. not enough people think about that in terms of, okay, but what's actually the best way to do it? What, well, what's well, the modern way of doing this? You know, we're, we're not still putting the rivets in the machines ourselves, are we? We've got robots doing that. That's modern manufacturing. What does modern leadership look like? I think I know the answer, but yeah. <laughs> I like that question. I, I'm, I'm, I would love for you to expand on that. Do, do you have the answer? Well, I have an answer. Okay, an answer. And, you know, whether there's uh, whereas whether there's only one, I don't know. P possibly not, because yeah, everyone has their own view on leadership, don't they? But sure. It's exactly the sort of things we've been talking about. It's what we talk about on on the podcast week in week out. It's it's that integrity driven. It's the people first. Words like empathy and empowerment and staff autonomy, engagement, happiness, even at work. It's putting those kind of things at the center, the core, the values of your leadership, why you are doing it. And yes, the shareholders always <laughs> have to be a stakeholder, don't they? Because ultimately they're paying the bills, um, at least until you've got enough sales to keep yourself sustained. But I think what so many people who use the shareholders as their driving force forget is if you don't treat the people doing the work in the right way, if you don't look after them, if you don't inspire, encourage, support them, none of those outcomes are going to happen. And so you're not going to please the shareholders either. And it's, and that there isn't a disconnect there yet. So many people see there is, if that makes sense. If I could say back to you what I'm hearing, it's, it's human centric. It's yes, yeah, focused on the people, the humanity of the business. You know, I was, I was thinking about leadership and. We didn't say it, but it's usually that A type personality that's driven of, yeah, I need, I need to rule this. I need to control this. And again, that's human development. People want to control something or they want status or they want to amass the resources and nothing's wrong with those. It's just that when they are used to the, for the not well being of the masses or for the individual. Like all those things are good to come by, but if they're not used to improve the well, the, the well-being of other, of yourself and other people, then what's the point of it? Yeah. I mean, I think back to the way you defined trust earlier, even like the, the staunchest traditional leader, the, the autocrat, 
are mm-hmm. still probably going to admit that the, they need some level of trust with the people they're leading in order for it to work. And one of your three components of trust is trusting that that leader is doing things in my best interest. Yeah. And that, and you reminded me again of that. So that I think has it all, at least for now. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, think about it. A, a person, a person is a leader because they were elected to that role. And if they weren't elected, if the only leaders, and this may be a touchy situation for you, if the only leaders who weren't chosen by the people are the monarchs, <laughs> are the people who were appointed by God. <laughs> um, and, and that's a whole nother conversation in Britain. But then if you don't think your leader is looking out for you, yeah, there's going to be a revolt. Whereas you can have monarchs and it's just like, no, they're a, a benevolent monarch and the people love them. Yeah. I mean, there's a whole conversation about what monarchy looks like in, in modern Britain, certainly. Um, yeah. I, I'd actually question whether they're in a leadership role at this point, but that's the can of worms that I possibly don't want to open right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually. <laughs> Uh, although interestingly, a total tangent, but I saw a, a, a random clip on, I think it was Facebook the other day. It was a speech or an interview that Stephen Fry was doing. I think it was Stephen Fry. If it wasn't him, it was someone like, very like him. <laughs> and he was talking about an the, intellectual. The, yeah. And he was talking about the, the, from a statistical point of view, if you look at the, the rights and the privileges that the population at large has, the ones with the most civil liberties, the highest rights, the most kind of privileges in society as in terms of the whole population, those countries are led by monarchies or at least constitutional monarchies like the UK. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was really interesting. I'd never well, made that connection, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll say like this, I'll say like this. Um, correlation doesn't mean causation. That True. is to say. A lot of people with a the monarchy, they went out and they uh, they colonized places to take their resources. So, well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, in in, in Britain's case, in particular, you know, you, there's a strong argument that the reason those rights and privileges existed is for the same reason that the monarchy still exists. Is it was a bargain, mm-hmm. <laughs> and if that bargain hadn't been made, the monarchy would probably be gone by now. So, you know, <laughs> it's, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I, I get why Brits, those who do still support the monarchy, because it brings in a lot of revenue. <laughs> you know, <laughs> is it worth it? Now, now we have to rene- renegotiate the contract, right? Yeah, it's it's a tough one. It is a tough one. I, I, you know, there's, I, I'm not convinced on the revenue side of it. I don't think the average Brit is really thinking about that. I'm sure there are high level politicians um, who are, no doubt, but. I, I don't know. I, I think it, it goes back to what we were saying about culture earlier and how it's just, it's, it's an identity almost. Mm. I think that's the way most or the average Brit would see it. Let's not go any further down that rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, it's funny. Uh, and I won't go down the rabbit hole, uh, no, but it's yeah. funny. Oftentimes when I'm doing podcasts in the U S. They're like, yeah, we can talk about anything. We just don't talk about this in politics. But now I'm in the UK, it's just like, yeah, we'll talk about anything. Let's not talk about the monarchy. <laughs> I mean, I happily talk about it. I just don't think the listeners ah. will, will really care. But also, I'm, <laughs> I'm slightly worried I might get exiled or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, I guess, That's... obviously. But... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get you. Yeah. Anyway, so let's, let's get back on topic. If you could go back in time, how far back in your own lifetime would you go? And what would you say to your younger self? <laughs> go back to this morning. Do it now. <laughs> like do, do the work you need to do. Yeah, it is a difficult question. Just because I find so much gratitude in this present moment. Everything that I did before now has brought me to this moment. And that said, yeah, I would ask myself very close to this moment. Is this what's important now to bring about the future you want? Um, anytime, anytime in the, in the past, I'd, I'd go to any time in the past and I'd ask myself that because I think future Marcus, who is in a better position than me, in a more expanded position than me. Thank you for this question. That's beautiful. I think future Marcus is asking me right now, <laughs> is this the best use of your time to bring about me, to bring about the vision you hold of me? That is a very unique answer. I don't think anyone's ever answered it that way. 
it's nearly always I'd go back to my first job or I'd go back to like when I was 18, something like that, and just say, you know, you're on the right path, keep doing what you're doing. That's, that's the, the stock answer. I don't think I've had anyone who said, yeah, I'd go back and do this specific event differently because I really regret it. That, so that's positive as well, but nobody said that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I love that answer. Yeah, I I love it. So it really is the same answer if you think about it. Because I said I would go back. I would go back to any time to tell myself, "Hey, well, it it wasn't it wasn't encouraging. You're it wasn't you're on the right path, but rather, hey, is this the right thing for you to be doing? But rather, is my future self coming back to now to say, hey, yeah, because I'm writing the story in the present. Yeah, I would go back to the past and be like, hey, thank you for what you've written. I would tell them thank you. Yeah. Leadership heroes. I only have one question left for you now. It is my favorite one though, and it's called leadership heroes. So if you had to pick a person, they could be anyone you like, alive, dead, past, present, real or fictional, even if if you're feeling like that, um, who in your opinion would perfectly embody leadership. Who would that person be and why? Oh, man. Two people came to mind. Um, I'll share both of them, but I'll share them quickly if that's okay. Nelson Mandela. Because how do you still be a leader towards people who hate you? How do you have a love for leading people who, while, while there's concrete, no pun intended, evidence of them trying to break your spirit? So I think that's awesome. And then he still came out and and did what he had to do. The other one is Marcus Aurelius, just because like there are faults in Marcus Aurelius that I see, but then even still, he, again, he kept his head about him. And in both of those two people who I mentioned, it is a strong identity. They knew who they were when the world was weighing on them and when the world misunderstood them. To be great is to be misunderstood. And when you're in a leadership position, yeah, th- that is a thing. They will misunderstand you. And how do you have the courage to be disliked and serve those who aren't understanding you? So those are the two leaders that come to mind. Yeah. They're both good choices. They've both been picked before. They're both popular. Um, <laughs> I think I would have been disappointed though, if you hadn't chosen your namesake, <laughs> well, I was getting ready to yeah, right? tease you if you hadn't. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, I like Marcus Aurelius. I, I think the thing is with him is he's so far back in the history that we've got really only his sort of word, <laughs> what kind of leader he was, his writings. Um, right. So if, if we are the stories we tell ourselves, he literally wrote his story. Well, true. And then it was supposed to be lost to antiquity. And then other people came along and, and a lot of the modern writers were writing, we're writing like, if the person heard it third, like it's Chinese whispers, they call it. But if it's telephone, you're writing. The message is muddled. Mm-hmm. But like Marcus knew at the source what he was going through. And he knew all the other stuff of how he wasn't showing up. And I love how he was just there encouraging himself. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the other aspect with him, of course, is he, he may have got a better reputation in hindsight because of how terrible his immediate successor was. <laughs> I mean, he was one you know? of like, the all-time worst emperors of Rome, wasn't he? Like, just horrible, horrible stuff. So um, <laughs> I think you'll appreciate this. I, I really appreciate this as with the work I do. Marcus, when he was young, he would read Plato, and it's stoic practice to go into sackcloth and ashes and like live in hardship. So he was sleeping on the floor. His mother came in and put him in the bed, tucked him away. He was adopted into the royal family and he had tutors who helped him. And I think that's why philosophy stuck with him so much. His son, Commodus, he was a twin and his twin brother died. Marcus had 14 children, but these were the only boys that he had or maybe some others. And um the thing about Commodus, when he was younger, his bath water was tepid and he had one of the servants, he commanded one of the servants to be thrown into the fire to make it warm. So to appease him, they took goat skin and they put it on the fire so it would smell like someone was burning. My point being, at a young age, these two people 
they had the understanding of entitlement and what the world owed them. And like their vision of the world was set at that young age. And I think that's what contributed to their eventual personality that came out. Yeah. Two very different interpretations and personalities as a result of, in some ways, very similar circumstances. But yeah, it's an interesting, it's one of those things in the, the kind of the foibles of human nature. <laughs> I, I think it's the environment yeah. which which brought out this this character. Again, there's a book called The Price of Privilege. In the developed world, a lot of people who are in privilege don't know who they are. They don't know how to handle conflict. And then they do stuff like what Commodus did. Yeah. It's, it, again, human development. Yeah. Interesting one. Um, yes. And Nelson Mandela. I can't not say anything else about him. I mean, so one of my favorite quotes on leadership is is one of his. Um, and I'll paraphrase it because it's quite long and I can't always remember it word for word. But it was basically about anyone can lead when things are easy. You know, people don't want you to be up the front and doing that kind of traditional leadership approach when, when things are good and things are safe. But what they really need and expect from their leader is when things are bad, when there's danger, is for you to stand between them and the danger. And again, horrible mm-hmm. paraphrasing, but I think I got the kind of the, the intent of the words at least. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's such a, I, I really like it because it, A, it speaks to the man and what he went through mm-hmm. and everything he learned about leadership. But B, it's such a stark and powerful description of leadership. And yes, it's, it's probably a bit too grand for the average company or team, but I think the, the sentiment is meaningful. It's the same principles, just at a different level of yeah. expression. One thing that I really liked in this exercise, thinking about it, because I also thought Churchill and I thought Gandhi, two totally different people. When I think about them, though, I also think about their disempowering character traits, like the bad things about them. But it's just like the principles are all the same, just had a different level of expression. And they did great things for their their culture, their community. Their They, they both showed up, again, with the same principles, just at a different level expression yeah so even if you are running a small company or a small family it's the same principles absolutely absolutely yeah i, th- I think it's it's just it's the scale isn't it and and the severity perhaps like the, the danger to take the quote in a small company it's not going to be literal danger or potential death or anything like that at least i hope not if it is then something else has gone very very wrong with your business uh, yeah, <laughs> but it might be like the danger of COVID or economic crisis, things that will be worrying people that they will want or expect or need even you as their leader to get in the way and protect them from it a little bit, or at least yeah. ease their transition into whatever the result is. We call it the stakes. What do you have yeah. to gain and what do you have to lose? Absolutely. Well, what a lovely conversation, Marcus. I really enjoyed that. And um, Yes, we've gone all over the place and all sorts of lovely tangents, wonderful topics that I've really enjoyed. I hope the listeners have as well. I'm sure they have. I hope you've enjoyed the conversation. Um, Early. And one last thing I will ask you. I know I said it was my last question before, but I lied a little bit. If any of the listeners want to learn more about you, I'm sure many of them do. If any of them perhaps might want to work with you or benefit from your services, where can they go to learn more? You can go to marcushiggs.com and learn about what I do there. Um, I am looking for beta testers for the show up framework that I am putting together for, for parents to show up for their preteens and open up the communication. I hang out on LinkedIn. You can look for me there on other social media, not so much, but LinkedIn and Marcus Aurelius or Marcus Higgs will find me there. Excellent. And I'll put those links in the episode description so everyone can find it easily as well. Well, that's it. Thank you so much for your time. It's been great meeting you and great talking to you today. David, thank you for hosting and thank you for the questions. You're most welcome. Marcus, thank you again so much for your time today and your conversation. We covered all sorts of really important topics there for leadership and for the parents in the audience. And we went down some great tangents that I really enjoyed. I I did not expect to be talking about the royal family today, for example. 
Listener, I hope you enjoyed that. If you would like to learn more about Marcus, if you have a child 10 to 14 years old and you are looking for some support or some coaching in how best to communicate with them, you will find Marcus's details, his website and his LinkedIn profile in the episode description. So I do encourage you, click on those links, go and read more about him and get in touch. I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. Thank you again for listening. Hope you'll join me again next week when we will be starting a series on burnout what leaders can do to recognize the signs of it in themselves, their people, and then the steps to take to address it, to deal with it, hopefully to prevent it happening again. So the first of those conversations will be with burnout prevention coach, Eugene Lee, who I've known for a little while now. I was actually on his podcast a year or so ago. I've lost track of time, but it was last year, I think. Thoroughly enjoyed the experience of being a guest. Learned quite a bit about myself and my own burnout experiences as a result of that conversation too. So I'm really looking forward to getting him on the show so we can hear about his journey as well. So don't miss that one. That's all from me today. So until next week, be a leader, not a boss.